Have you ever had an experience that left you thinking, I should have known better? Often these are bad experiences. And in a moment, you'll, if you've got one that you wouldn't mind sharing, you'll have an opportunity to do that and help us to know better. The 1964 Beatles album, A Hard Day's Night, included a song written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney that describes a delightful surprise. I should have a girl like you that I would love everything that you do and I do hey, hey and I do oh, I... oh did anybody expect to hear Ken grooving to the Beatles tonight <laughs> well for for uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon, their song is about a delightful surprise, but they sang, I should have known better. My should have been known better experiences are not quite that delightful, but uh, have you had an experience that left you thinking, I should have known better? One of those, any, anyone have one of, the, one of those kinds of things that might be something we can learn from? Every time I say I I don't need to write that down, I, I should have known better because I'll remember I'll remember where I put it or I'll remember that I don't need to write it down. I should always know better than that. I I can tell you with certainty you're not alone in that. I don't know about y'all, but I can tell you with certainly certainty you're not alone. Um, recently going to ESL and having one student and, and I had a pretty good feeling it was going to be just one student there and I really wasn't terribly excited about that uh, but when I got there and after the lesson it was a tremendous blessing and uh, I should have known better. Very good. So you had a delightful should have known better experience. Well, the book of Ecclesiastes describes experimenting with every kind of pleasure under the sun, only to find them all to be vanity, which can also be translated as unfulfilling, meaningless, worthless. Dr. Spivey, I'm going to put you on the spot here. And, and if you need to phone a friend, I'm sure Lyndall Anderson or Bud Smith can help you. But Ecclesiastes tells us that the author is the son of David. And later he says that he's wiser than those anyone who came before him. Who is a likely candidate for the author of Ecclesiastes? Yes. I should have known better. <laughs> um, that's not the name. Well, that's a tough one. Probably, probably so. I, 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 th I think so. The, the author is not named, but with those, with those two indications, it, it kind of limits it. Well, Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. And the book of Ecclesiastes is full of his should have known better experiences. The Hebrew title for Ecclesiastes is Kohelet, and please don't trust me for pronouncing that correctly. I have often said I used to know a little Hebrew and a little Greek uh, until they retired and sold their delicatessen. Anyway, Kohelet translates as the lecturer, the lecturer in an assembly. Some texts make it a, a, a personal name so they don't translate it. They just cohel it. And I'm of, I'm of the opinion, I'm joining lots of other people in this, that since it has a 
a direct article, it should be translated as a title, not a name. So it translates as the preacher or the teacher. And that's largely based on the, the Greek translation. The Greek word for, for kohelet is ecclesiastes, built on the Greek word ecclesia. Okay, you've had your chance. Anyone, else, anyone know what ecclesia means in Greek? Yes. Church. Church. So the, the assembly, the church, and Ecclesiastes is the one who calls the church together, calls the assembly together. So it's translated as uh, the preacher or the teacher. Solomon's reign started well. In spite of his wisdom, he didn't stay close to God. He should have known better. Now King Solomon lived, loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives. They were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. First Kings chapter 11 verses 1 through 3. In spite of his wisdom, he did not stay close to God. He should have known better. In writing Ecclesiastes, Solomon searches for the ultimate maxim to explain the meaning of life. His search becomes, the search leads him to become despondent, uh, reflecting on pleasure, wealth, wisdom, power. And he foolishly concludes that there's nothing better to do than to eat, drink, and be merry. In Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 8, verse 15, we read, <clears throat> So I can commend enjoyment because there's nothing better for people to do under the sun but to eat, Drink and be merry. Saying that this was a foolish conclusion for Solomon is not something I say lightly, but I'm sure you are familiar with the New Testament allusion. Uh, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. <clears throat> then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Luke 12, 19 and 20. In Ecclesiastes 1, Solomon considers wisdom. I thought to myself, I have become much wiser than any of my predecessors who ruled over Jerusalem. I have acquired much wisdom and knowledge. So I decided to discern the benefit of wisdom and knowledge over foolish behavior and ideas. However, I concluded that even this endeavor is like trying to chase the wind. For with great wisdom comes great frustration. Whoever increases his knowledge merely increases his heartache. Ecclesiastes 1 verses 16 to 18. In Proverbs, he says of wisdom, Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. Proverbs 3.17 In Ecclesiastes, the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge lead to frustration and heartache. In Proverbs, all wisdom's ways are pleasant and peaceful. If you didn't know better, you might wonder if the author of Ecclesiastes had ever read Proverbs. 
In Ecclesiastes 2, he considers self-indulgent pleasure, including wine. I thought to myself, come now, I will try self-indulgent pleasure to see if it's worthwhile. I thought deeply about the effects of indulging myself with wine. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 and 3. Proverbs has some well-known verses about wine. It does not forbid the use of wine, but it does speak against self-indulgent excess. In Proverbs 20, verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, and beer a brawler, and whoever is led astray by them is not wise. In Proverbs, Solomon knows wine is a mocker. Later, when writing Ecclesiastes, he decides to experiment to find out on his own. This actually violates what may be the best known verses in Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And as long as we're in the neighborhood, let's include verse 7 also. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Some people put a positive spin on Ecclesiastes. They say it expresses the remorse of a repentant Solomon after his, his arrogant carnality and tolerance of idolatry. In the end, he returns to the fear of the Lord. I, I like positive, redemptive spin, but there are some problems with Ecclesiastes. First, it, it seems to be forced. It doesn't seem to be a natural reading of the text. When he says, fear God and enjoy life as you can, they seem to be uh, reluctant dismal conclusions instead of victorious celebrations. Second, scripture does not describe Solomon coming to repentance. So if we read this without thinking he, he repented, his, his conclusion is pretty much the same as what he started with. Life is meaningless. The best known words from the text is vanity, which is also translated as useless or meaningless. Some Christians find Ecclesiastes troubling because it does start with saying that life is meaningless. It declares uh, all of life is meaningless. Many Christians have a hard time getting past that. Uh, they wonder why it's in the Bible. Ecclesiastes examines some of the typical pursuits of life wealth, pleasure, accomplishments, power, only to find them unfulfilling. Ecclesiastes confronts us with the fact that life without God is meaningless. It may not have been Solomon's intention, but Ecclesiastes drives us to God in a unique way. We said earlier that Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes but third person references in Ecclesiastes 1, 1 and 12, 9 to 14 suggest that someone wrote the introduction and conclusion to the book. The narrator who opens and closes Solomon's words is the one who concludes that everything under the sun is meaningless. But unlike Solomon, this narrator looks higher he makes no reference to enjoy life as you can, and he puts the fear of God in a different context. Here is the end of the matter after all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. Some translations re replace the word fear with reverence. And that probably paints an incomplete picture. 
the fear of the Lord in the Old Testament refers to being absolutely overwhelmed with God's presence, his person, his power, his holiness. When we say reverence, we're probably being too passive in our response to God. The fear of the Lord is a natural response to recognizing who he is. For the wicked, it is totally terrifying. For the righteous, it is absolutely overwhelming. We can look at the wisdom Solomon was given and the things he said. We can look at the way he lived and think he should have known better. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. But in spite of that, he knew better than he did. I hope none of us spend the last years of our life and ministry in that should have known better zone. We said earlier that some people could read Ecclesiastes and wonder if the author had ever read Proverbs. There are some scholars who go even farther. Some scholars blatantly declare that Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are contradictory and impossible to reconcile. Solomon, when he was living in obedience, declared all wisdom's paths to be pleasant. When living in disobedience, he called wisdom frustrating. When you know the right thing to do and don't do it, of course you're going to be frustrated. These are not contradictory ideas. When Solomon was living in obedience, he declared wine to be a mocker. When he was living in disobedience, he experimented with self-indulgent drinking and found it to be worthless and meaningless. These are not contradictory ideas. When Solomon was living in obedience, when he trusted the Lord, when he did not lean on his own understanding, God directed his paths. When he was living in disobedience, trusting in his own understanding instead of the Lord, he found life meaningless. Those ideas are not contradictory. Imagine two people standing on a beach, looking at a starfish that was left behind by the tide. One person can look beyond the starfish to see sand giving way to waves going all the way to the horizon. The other person can look beyond the starfish to see sand giving way to a grassy plain with a mountain in the distance. Neither view is wrong. They are both correct views. They're looking at the same starfish from a different perspective. Ecclesiastes and Proverbs are not contradictory. They're looking at the same starfish from a different perspective. They are teaching the same truth from different positions. One can only see this side. One can only see this side. But both views are accurate. So Psalm, uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are not contradictory. They are complementary.